We are going back to the basics, and we're just walking through the Ten Commandments at this time. And let me see if I can actually do that. I bet you it's not plugged in, Lauren. That uh, silver cord will do the trick. And then we should be able to... And just like that, there we go. Back to the basics. The Eighth Commandment, if you had to guess what it's about. Gossip. Yeah. False testimony. Let's see what our God has to say. Number one, a person's reputation is easy to ruin. Um, what do you think? Ah, uh, yeah. It's very easy to ruin. How about two? Being a good friend means standing with him when he does something stupid. <laughs> Maybe. This is the hold my juice box moment, right? Where I'm going to go jump off a cliff or something. Yeah, this is... You kind of have to question sometimes whether it's wise. Three, when we learn of a person's sin, the first thing we should do is tell the pastor. No, 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 no. I, I don't want to hear that. In fact... If you called me and said, so-and-so did this to me, I would say, well, have you talked to him about it? And we're going to go through that, those steps in Matthew 18. Four, we should never, ever betray a confidence no matter what. Hmm. If you are in any kind of an industry that involves uh, people that are under your care, you're familiar with a duty to warn, um, whether that be a police officer, teacher, pastor, counselor, that exists where legally you have to. And so if someone tells me, well, I think I'm going to go kill my cousin. Okay. Well, either you tell somebody that you're going to do this or I have to. Because I don't feel like losing my job or going to jail. So that's, that's how that works. Sometimes you have to be, betray a confidence for good. And I, I love those laws. I think that that's wonderful. So, All right, let's look at the... Eighth commandment, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and take his words and actions in the kindest possible way. Number one. Good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. I may have jumped the gun there with the button, but the, the point is clear. How easy is it to fix a reputation? And I have online a Daniel Hill left a, a five-star review of our church. That's awesome, guys. <laughs> Friendly and inviting. Everyone makes you feel welcome. Multiple community events, family games, nights, cookouts, etc. Held at a building throughout the year. Other activities and events for all ages as well. Our family are now members after moving to the area from Milwaukee. Thank you, Daniel. That, that, that's wonderful. Now, we have a 4.7 star rating on Google. How easy is it to change that if it gets low? It's hard. In fact, you can hire companies who will leave fake reviews. This is the thing about reputation online. Is it real? When you go on Amazon and you're about to buy a new tripod for the stand, and you don't know, right? This is hard. Reputation's a big deal. In fact, if my reputation is sullied so badly, I know of colleagues, classmates, who have lost their jobs because their reputation is damaged, and you cannot fix that. It's really, really hard. And so, this is why God dedicates a commandment to it. Because they're, even before the internet, reputation was a big deal. Now, <clears throat> what is the consequence if you don't have a good name? Let's say that the uh, star rating was a one and there was nothing good ever said about me and then you know who I am because I'm infamous and I come up and I try to share the gospel with you. What? How would that go? You wouldn't trust me. That's the problem. Especially for a Christian because the goal is to be able to share the gospel. You, you, that, that's it. And so if people can't trust our message, that's horrible. That's our most important job in life, is to be witnesses for Christ. So, yeah, that, that's the consequence. Three, what does God want us to do and not to do when we learn of another person's sin? This is Matthew 18. This walks us through what to do. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. 
If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. Yes, so instead of calling pastor, what are you supposed to do if someone hurts you or wrongs you? Yeah, Dan says call him. That's that's the first thing you do. All right, what are the next steps? Do you know? Let's say that Dan calls them and they don't listen. What, What could Dan do next? Dan would probably go get his, his buddy Carl and say, Carl, Pastor Fred just t- told me a terrible joke about my Packers. I can't stand it. And so Carl would come and talk to me. And so, yeah, you bring a friend. What happens after that? This is, this is tongue-in-cheek with the Packers, but yeah. Usually it's something far worse. Because here's the deal. Unrepentant sin damns. And that's why if someone sins against you, it's your job. It's not fun. It's not fair. But God says, that's your job, to go tell them this was wrong. And in Christian love, reach out to them. Next thing you do, you tell it to the church. And this is not bam, bam, how to get rid of people. This is in love, how do we save a soul? Because the goal is repentance. The goal is to get them to turn away from that sin that is so de- deadly to their soul. Now, how many times, for those of you who have been a member for a while, have we brought before you a public sin of a member of our church? Zero. Now, little churches have little problems. The church that I spent time in when I was at the seminary, they had 1,200 members. Every time they had a congregational meeting, there was an instance of this. I mean, that, that, that was an extreme case where the guy divorced his wife, got a girlfriend, but he liked the church, so he was bringing her to, her to church, and his wife and children were in, were in a different pew. And he didn't think there was any... Yeah, everyone's like, buddy, really? And so this is... But that, that's what they were dealing with, because... Well, we got you know, you can't just ignore it. So that, that's, you got to talk to them. And finally, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. And a lot has been written as to what exactly that means. And we talked about that in our early Bible study. Something has to change. I'm not saying you can't be friends with them. I, can't, I would welcome them to worship. But I would probably not let them come to the Lord's Supper if they're caught in an unrepentant sin. But something has to have changed. So that they understand that this is really dangerous. And I think that all of this falls under the Eighth Commandment where we want to preserve their reputation and most importantly, we preserve their, their soul too. So, Any questions on church discipline otherwise? Five, can you think of an example of speaking the truth in love? Has anyone ever given you bad news? But they did it in a really nice way. Once in a while, Jenna will tell me, um, honey, you don't have a belt on. Okay? And that's speaking the truth in love because she loves me and she doesn't want me to walk out the door and give her, my God, in this church. That's the pastor that doesn't know how to wear a belt. You know? that, that, again, that's a tug cheek example. But at some point, you have to tell somebody, they, and they may not like what you have to say, but if you're speaking the truth in love, I, I pray that they take your rebuke with a gentle heart. Uh, next one, evaluate. Jane felt that in Christian love and for the sake of relationships, she should listen sympathetically when her friend complains to her about others. Hmm. What could her friend tell Jane? What do you think? Let's ask the teenagers in the back. Emmy, has anybody ever tried to bring tea? Do you, do, do you, know, do you know what tea is? Yeah. What's the tea, Emmy? Yeah. And then the tea is the, the gossip in, 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 the, in the hallway. And we were at Camp Key Row last year. Um, the organizer of the camp made a big deal about loyalty. And what are the other teas? Honest tea. There we go. Honest tea. That's what you want to give to people. But you can speak the truth, speak the tea in love. And so at some point, my middle school daughters high school now, excuse me, high school daughters may need to tell their friends, no, I don't want to hear the tea. Because that's not helpful. That's hard to do. That's hard, very hard to do. But, yeah. Seven, this is the last slide. First Peter 22, 2, 22 and 23. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, 
He did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. What did Jesus do to save us from our sins against the Eighth Commandment? How much gossip do you think he knew? (laughs) All of it. But he didn't share that with his disciples. He told his disciples, nobody needs to be the the greatest. Be a servant. There there are so many things that he could have done wrong. And of course, he's been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet was without sin. Luther said, when I want to harm my neighbor by lying, in body, possessions, honor, name, this is telling real lies. Say this, any questions at all? Otherwise, say this prayer with me, please. Lord, keep us from sins of the tongue into which we so easily fall. Where we have failed, forgive us. Empower us to use the gift of speech in ways that glorify You and benefit others. In our Savior's name we ask this. Amen. There are no other announcements. Um, May God give you all a blessed week.